with the Community Technical Assistance Center of New York. I am so happy that you're going to be joining us for this wonderful topic, this wonderful webinar presented by Dr. Monica Williams of Louisville University. So, uh, sorry, the University of Louisville, actually. Um, I do want to do some housekeeping things before we do get started. So many of you have signed up for CEUs. I do want to make sure that you do receive your credit. So please make sure that you have an account for the CEUs. All of the information can be found in your chat box on the right. And there is a $15 nominal fee. You will receive one credit, and I will get back to this information at the end of the webinar. I do want to make sure that you all have it in the beginning. So if you want to get started, Dr. Williams, please take it away. Okay, great. Well, I am so glad to be here today. Um, just going to give you a little information about myself since you can't see me today. Here's, here's a picture of me with a couple of my wonderful grad students. I'm the one in the red, and those are my awesome students on the right. That's uh, from a conference we went to not too long ago. Um, so I am, yeah, the director of the Center for Mental Health Disparities at the University of Louisville. Um, I am also an associate professor in the Department of Psychological and Brain Sciences. Um, I am actually the first tenured minority female in that department's 108-year history. So, um, of course, I was really excited about that. And on the other hand, I think it shows we still have a long way to go. Um, I am the clinical director of the Behavioral Wellness Counseling Clinic in, in Louisville, Kentucky and I'm licensed uh, as a psychologist in two states, um, Kentucky and Pennsylvania. So I do a lot of clinical work and I do a lot of teaching and I do a lot of research. Um, and I also write for the um, public and I've even received some appreciation from a few hate groups as well, including um, the Council of Conservative Citizens who have deemed me a enemy of white America. So. Uh, that's my resume. Perhaps that last accomplishment is my, my proudest one. All right. So without any further ado, let's get started with our presentation. Um, before I really dig into things, I like to give a little bit of warning. So this presentation may make you uncomfortable. There are a lot of stereotypes about different ethnic and racial groups. And as a society, we're socialized not to talk about these things. And so a lot of us don't have practice talking about um, our race or what it means to be um, a member of our, of our group. Uh, many people are afraid to talk about these things because they're, uh, they don't want to be perceived as being a racist, so they, they maybe avoid. And, um, and that's actually not really helpful, and we're going to talk more about that to, uh, today as well. Um, I'm going to try to make you laugh because uh, sometimes this material is a little tough. Uh, so this is my this is my cool dad meme on the right here. He says, "I won't have my daughter bringing a black man into this house until I've had time to buy Afrocentric art for the foyer." So that's the cool dad. I wish I had had a cool dad like that. Um, anyway, some of you are still going to be uncomfortable, and that's okay. If you feel uncomfortable, totally expected because. Uh, Basically, we're going to be talking about a lot of things that you're not used to talking about. And so given that all audiences that I've worked with, um, including the public, undergrads, graduate students, medical students, and even professionals in psychology and medicine, have told me that this topic matter can be difficult at times, I want you to all know that I'm making some assumptions about you. And I assure you they are only the best assumptions. Um, assumption number one is that if you experience discomfort during this talk, it's because you're in one or more of the following groups. Either you're, you're caring, empathetic, you least, are least likely to offend others, and you want to avoid causing harm, um, or that you've been exposed to racism either personally or in your environment, or both. And, um, and I really do believe that all of you are here because you care about your clients and you want to do even better. And there's always, always room to do better. Um, and if you're interested in um, downloading the slides we have, well, we have a very nice handout that's been provided, but you can also download them from um, our Mental Health Disparities website as well, as, as well as some of the readings and references that I'll be referring to in the course of this presentation. Okay, so um, the first thing I want to touch on is what is cultural competence, right? 
because ideally um, all of you want to be culturally competent in, in your work with other people. And so there's kind of two levels of cultural competence that I like to refer to. Uh, the first one is what we call ethnically sensitive therapy, right? So, um, and I hope that most of you are practicing it at the very least ethnically sensitive therapy. And this is where we, when we are aware of the existence of cultural differences, so you realize that somebody from a different culture may think about things a little differently than you do. Um, you have some basic knowledge of the client's culture that you're able to distinguish culture from psychopathology and that you take their culture into account in some way when you're doing assessment and treatment. And, and then, and I think it's important to point out that all of the other therapeutic skills that you have learned and been using, such as empathy and, um, and your um, particular specific therapeutic modality, these are all going to still be important when working with people from different racial and ethnic groups. But in addition to that, you have some um, understanding of culture. And now the next level is what we call multicultural counseling competence. And this is where we're all trying to move toward uh, because ethnically sensitive therapy can help, but it can only get us so far. And multicultural counseling competence means that you're aware of your own cultural heritage and biases that may come with that heritage and you respect others' help-giving practices, even if they maybe don't make a lot of sense to us or don't fit into our Western conceptualizations of mental health care. It means that we have knowledge, such as understanding some of the socio-political factors that affect the lives of ethnic minorities, and that we have appropriate skills for sending and receiving um, verbal and nonverbal messages. And so, so these are all the um, important elements of really having multicultural counseling competence. And again, this is all what we want to be moving toward um, as clinicians. Okay, so one of the things that is really important to understand when working with ethnic and racial minorities is the experience of racism. And so the first question I want to pose to you as an audience is, can the experience of racism be traumatic? And so this is a chance for you to, to vote You'll um, have a chance to respond to the poll here, and you'll see some bubbles, and A is yes, B is no, and C is I'm not sure. So I want to get the lay of the land and see what, what you all think right now. So please go ahead and, and make your vote. And you have uh, a few minutes to do this, but the sooner the better. Okay, so the poll is ended, and let's see what our results are. All right, so it looks like the vast majority of you, let's see, 65% say that you think that the experience of racism can be traumatic. Um, a couple people either not sure and then a number of you didn't answer. So um, those of you who said can't, who answered yes, you are right. The experience of racism can be traumatic and we're going to talk about that today. But if you weren't sure that's okay, I assume that's why you're here, right, to learn more about this. So um, it, this can be like a sticky question because even experts that I've worked with, experts in um, PTSD have been confused about the role of racism in trauma, and so that's what we're going to going to talk about. And um, and I want to really um, impress on you that it it can be um, a trauma, and all of us who um, experience all of us who are ethnic minorities, we experience some some degree of racism and discrimination on a regular basis, whether or not even we're actually aware of it. Um, and research shows that. Um, among those of us who identify as ethnic and racial minorities, uh, African Americans report the most instances of discrimination. Um, and this is closely followed by Hispanic Americans and Asian Americans who also experience a great deal of racism. And, um, and there are other types of discrimination that people experience, such as due to their gender and um, sexual orientation. 
And all of these are found to um, be harmful to the person on the receiving end. And so what's really interesting is that research shows that different ethnic and racial groups are affected differently by racism and discrimination. And one study found that Hispanic Americans who experienced more racism were significantly more likely to have symptoms of major depressive disorder. Um, additionally, African Americans were more likely to report symptoms that looked a lot like post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, and what's even more interesting is that uh, the darker a person's skin, the more likely they are to report experiencing racism. Um, so um, one study found that um, among dark-skinned black adults, 67% said that they experienced frequent racism, where as very light-skinned African Americans, um, only 8% said they experienced a lot of racism. So, um, so it definitely varies based on how you look. All right, so here's a little bit about some types of racism. And for those of you who are wondering, this is a, this is a uh, Confederate flag in Richmond, Virginia. And this is a billboard someone put up next to the flag um, to share their opinion about what they thought of the person who put this flag up. So, and, and I gotta tell you, that's a whole nother ball of wax. I actually wrote um, a blog article on psychology today about the Confederate flag and, um, and its role in perpetuating racism, which I encourage you to check out when you get a chance. So what is racism? Well, there's several kinds of racism, um, and it can be defined as the routine institutionalized mistreatment of a person based on his or her membership in a racial group on the downside of power. And so we have dominative racism, and this is a very um, traditional form of bigotry where people uh, will just very freely say, I hate that person because they're a person of color. <clears throat> and they may not put it even in such kind words. Um, then we have what's called symbolic or modern racism, and these are people who embrace negative stereotypes about um, different ethnic groups and then believe those groups are inferior to white people because people in those other groups aren't conforming. And then we have aversive racism, and this is probably one of the most common types of racism that I run into, is, where, is among people who um, say that they support racial equality, but then they actually have very conflicted um, negative feelings uh, toward minorities, and these may be unconscious feelings, but that they, then they end up acting on them when, um, when it's not clear um, what, their behavior is, what their behavior means. And then finally, we have microaggressions, which um, are small racist acts that are um, not clearly racially motivated, but they create a lot of uncertainty and anxiety in minorities. And we'll talk a little more about those as we go as well. <clears throat> So, um, so I saw a few comments uh, from folks, and I saw somebody mention that they are tra still traumatized by racism, and I'm, I'm not surprised because racism is traumatic. I have felt trauma from racism, and so, and I've treated people who've been traumatized by racism. So, so it is a real phenomenon. Um, okay, and here's a few examples of just of different types and different levels of racism. Um, one form is shop is being followed in stores while shopping, and sometimes you know me and my African American um, friends and family we call this shopping while black, um, where you've got people in the store who you seem to be boring a hole into you with their eyes, um, at cashiers uh, asking for extra identification from people uh, because they're people of color, and I've run into this before. Uh, very very actually. In upsetting experience when I was in Philadelphia at a high-end restaurant here at the Capitol Grill, and I was treating a student to dinner, and um, and the manager was refusing to accept my credit card and because it had my husband's name on it, which uh, which is really ridiculous, but now that, um, that was a very upsetting experience for me. Um, insensitive remarks by coworkers and friends, and so this is sometimes really the most painful kind of racism because these are people that I, you know, that I care about and respect, and um, sometimes they say things without thinking about how that might make me as an African American woman feel. Um, profiling by 
law enforcement. Sometimes we call this driving while black. Um, and I like to tell the story about my dad, who um, his wife owned a beige Mercedes. And every time he would drive around town in the beige Mercedes, he would get pulled over by a cop who was demanding proof that this was actually his car because, God forbid, a black man drive a beige Mercedes. So he um, stopped driving and he, you know, kept driving his, his SUV because he didn't get harassed. So uh, we call that driving while black. Um, and, you know, it doesn't have to be black. It could be whatever um, ethnic group is out of favor in the area where you live. Um, being feared and avoided. So uh, maybe you're walking down the street and you see people locking their doors as you walk by. That's a form of racism. Um, racial slurs, being called the N-word or other really unsavory things. Uh, that's a form of racism. And threats, right? Sometimes we get threats on our, our person or our lives or our homes or our children um, because of who we are. And, and that's really upsetting as well. Um, somebody just uh, sent in a comment saying that uh, when I attempt to catch a cab on the upper west side of Manhattan, yellow cabs do not stop for me. Uh, they cannot see that I'm a person who holds two graduate degrees from the most influential graduate programs in the nation and indeed the world. So thank you for, your, for sharing your experience. And even though these things happen a lot, they can actually be painful. So. And anyone from any race can suffer as a result of racism. Um, people of any group can perpetrate racism. So I don't want you to think that I'm just bashing white people because even, you know, black people can be mean to Koreans or Hispanics, you know, can be mean to white people. So it, it can go in any direction. Um, although the research shows that those of us who are, who are classified as ethnic minorities um, are kind of getting the brunt of this in our society, but anybody can experience it and anyone can perpetrate it. And it's always a harmful thing. Okay. All right, so I mentioned microaggressions before. Um, and microaggressions are getting to be um, a little more well understood. Uh, they've been going on forever. They're not a new thing. Um, but these are little uh, subtle, small acts that are not clearly racially motivated, but they make those of us who are minorities feel a little crazy sometimes because we're wondering, did, did that just happen the way I think that it happened or was that totally innocuous? And so what happens is the targets of microaggressions are often forced to determine whether another person actually did something discriminatory. And this, ambiguous, and this ambiguity or the uncertainty that it creates, um, you know, causes anxiety as we try to find some explanation for the event. And so, and so this is one way that um, even small things can contribute to um, ongoing distress. And so think about how experiences like this on a regular basis could impact someone's mental health. So in terms of um, racism, there's um, one type of result of racism that we call race-based traumatic stress injury. And um, this includes three components including racial discrimination, which is avoiding or ostracizing the person because of his race or culture, racial harassment, which is hostile race-based physical or verbal assault, and then finally discriminatory harassment, where um, a person experiences hostility by things such as white flight from the neighborhood or isolation at work or people questioning someone's qualifications just because they're a minority. And all of these things can contribute to um, race-based traumatic stress and injury. And there are also a number of other mental health consequences as well that I would be remiss not to point out, including in addition to PTSD, which we have listed here, but stress, serious psychological distress that's, um, you know, that's classified as clinically relevant, uh, depression, binge drinking, and even binge eating. And, and there's a, host, a whole host of um, recent research that's been done that's mounting that shows that discrimination has some very um, serious and unfortunate mental health consequences. The consequences um, of these experiences can be cumulative. So um, somebody, so for, for most traumatic experiences, people will show signs of re-experiencing the event. I know that when things have happened to me, I have 
thought over and over again about it, and sometimes, um, you know, it's kind of hard to refocus, even though you may know that the person who did this doesn't even know you, and really it's not personal, it's about them, but, um, you know, but it still, it still can bother you. And in the case of race-based traumatic stress, the encounters can be cumulative, and so that even one small event can trigger somebody to become traumatized because of all the other stuff that they've been trying to juggle. So one may be stressed, but the level of stress may not reach a threshold for being traumatic until the trigger or, or that last straw. And in such an instance, the trigger could be a, a major event, but it could be something small too. And many minorities are reporting that the stress is not because of one event, but because of a series of emotional wounds and blows that they have experienced. And somebody um, asked if gender could also be added to the list of, um, of, reasons that, of reasons that people are discriminated against, and absolutely gender is, um, you know, gender is often a cause of discrimination. And then you can even have, um, you even have unique forms of discrimination based on the intersection of race and gender. So there are a whole host of stereotypes about black women just type it in Google. You'll get some results you don't want. Um, you know, that have to do with, um, you know, ideas about what it means to be a black woman. And there's some very specific um, stereos, stereotypes, or we call them archetypes, of, of um, black women based on um, some of our stereotypes and historical notions. So, so yeah, so don't, don't get me on that tangent. I could talk about that all day. <laughs> All right, so um, let's see. So someone pointed out that they find that many people in power can just ignore the presence of a qualified individual solely based on race, and this can be very stressful. And you know, when I mentioned aversive racism earlier, um, I think that that often you often see that among people with power as well. Um, so. So yeah, it's really it can be it can be hard. All right. Um, another another form of um, racism and discrimination is has been termed ethno violence by Janet Helms. Um, this is violence and intimidation directed at marginalized and stigmatized members of an ethnic group because of their inability or unwillingness to assimilate. So. Um, you know, so sometimes when people come from other countries, for example, they may, um, you know, they may speak a different language and speak with an accent and have different customs, but if their skin is white within a generation, they can assimilate um, into mainstream American society. Those of us who may have dark skin, um, we can't necessarily assimilate, and so ethno-violence punishes people because of their inability um, to assimilate. And so as a result, people in these ethnic groups are treated as symbols of undesirable cultural practices. Um, but it's, and, and in those cases, it's not really just about race, but it's about culture. It's about being different, having a different worldview, doing things differently. Um, and, and that's what's being punished. Okay, so how does racism cause trauma? So let's talk a little bit about the, the, the mechanism here, how it works. Uh, racist incidents are traumatic, so they affect survivors in ways that are analogous to the effect that rape and domestic violence have on their victims. So if you think about the commonalities here, um, the act of racism, it's a violation of, a, of an individual's personhood. Um, the victim feels disempowered or powerless. The event is unpredictable and uncontrollable. You don't know when it's going to happen. You can't stop it before it happens. And then when you may try to talk about it with other people, they may challenge or ridicule you and say, well, are you sure that's what happened? Um, really, which is very invalidating and prevents um, processing and healing. So, so that's how, um, that's uh, the mechanism for that, right? So if you think about it, let's say you were driving down the road and if somebody almost ran you off, off the freeway. Actually, this happened to me yesterday. And you, you feel, you might feel shock and you might, you might be upset and you might go home and tell your, your husband or your wife what happened to you that day and you may go over and over in your head and you may share it with other people and, and then eventually you process it and you move on. Well, if you can't process that event, then it stays with you and you have trouble moving on. 
And that's exactly what happens in cases like rape, domestic violence, and racial trauma, is people often don't have a space to process that because of shame um, about what happened to them or because others in their lives aren't willing to, aren't willing or able to be supportive and listen to it. Um, okay. So, so here's a comment from someone saying that if I want to go to the corner store of my neighborhood, I literally have to make sure that I have all of my identification just in case I'm stopped by the police. This is true for all the members of my family and most of my friends of color, particularly African American. At times, I do not feel I'm in a free country. So I am sorry, and I feel that too. And I think, and I thank you for sharing that because I think a lot of times it's easy to forget when some when other people have experiences that are different from yours. And one of the one of the privileges of white privilege is to not have to think about it. Whereas those of us of color, sometimes we have to think about it all the time. And I think that that's really important to understand um, when working with people across, uh, across race and, and culture. Okay, so I'm gonna give a little cultural case study. Um, and this is, a true, this is a true story of one of my clients um, that I actually published a, um, a, a bit of her account in a recent journal article that we wrote on cultural adaptations for um, prolonged exposure therapy for the treatment and prevention of PTSD um, that was published in Behavioral Sciences last year. Um, this is a story of PTSD in the workplace. So this is a 49-year-old African-American woman uh, living with um, a longtime partner, and she lived with her teenage daughter and her partner's daughter. She was very accomplished, had two master's degrees, including an MBA and, and a degree in information technology, and she worked as a professional at a large company that any of you would recognize the name if I told it to you. Um, she was paid well, but probably and most certainly underpaid for her skills. And she did trainings in computer security internationally for this company all over the world. She also did diversity trainings, which was not her area of expertise, but she felt passionate about it. And, um, and contributed to her company in that way as well. Uh, she was a role model to other black women in her workplace because she was the very, she was the highest ranking black woman in that company, which was at the level of director and then right underneath that was vice president and then president of the company. So she was, um, you know, she was pretty close to the top. And, and I mentioned she did diversity training. She had a lot of stress at work due to being the only black female in her position, but no psychiatric or mental health history of any type and had experienced many acts of racism over the years and had coped well with these. And one way she coped was being very buttoned down, all business, organized, and probably a bit perfectionistic and rigid in some ways as well um, as a way of coping. Um, all right. So while on a business trip in Sydney, she experienced, um, she was traumatized by a coworker during dinner. He had invited her to dinner and he was another director at the company. And when she got there, she saw he had been drinking and uh, he talked to her about a lot of his, a bit about his personal life, told her that he had been formerly in the military and that he was a crooked soldier and that other people in his in his squad were crooked as well and he bragged about the people that he had tortured and killed. He made racist statements to her. He threatened her life. He said, if you ever tell anybody any of this, I'll bury your body so deep no one will ever find it. And he made sexual advances as the icing on the cake. So she was terrified. Um, and as an African-American female, I think it's important to understand that being in a foreign country um, with a white coworker, her, her cultural fear was heightened because she didn't imagine that if he decided to do something that anyone would come to her rescue. I mean, who would believe that a former, former um, honorably discharged soldier was capable of murder and then making that body disappear? A black woman with a cultural understanding of undiscovered murders of black people would not only believe it, but be terrified that this was the perfect location and the perfect perpetrator. Um, she described looking into his face and seeing the face of the devil 
which for a very spiritual woman was even more frightening because she was especially vulnerable um, in that foreign country. Um, so she was terrified. She went back to her room after that and stayed up all night in the bathtub with a knife until she knew he had got boarded his plane and left. Um, she, When she got back to her job, she told her boss about it. And um, the coworker was, fri was actually promptly fired. And she was assured that everybody at all the security stations around the company would be warned to keep an eye out for him because she was worried he was going to come back with a gun and kill her and maybe everybody else. People sometimes don't respond well to being fired like that. Um, but then when she went back to work, um, turned out nobody, none of the security had any knowledge of this guy. Nobody had been informed. And then she started to really panic. She started to get paranoid thoughts and wonder if her white coworkers were out to get her. And she wondered even if the perpetrator had been sent to harass her, to punish her for her superior performance at work. Um, she uh, went home. She fell into uh, a depression. She wasn't able to function. And she um, became agoraphobic. Her sister had to bring her meals and walk her dog. And she um, didn't, didn't see any way that she could ever go back to work. Um, so, so that's when she realized that she needed some help. And so let me uh, show you this model here of ethno-violence and PTSD. Uh, so we f first have a racist event, and this is a negative, unexpected, uncontrollable violation, which is assault to someone's personhood, followed by a traumatic reaction, shock, disbelief, fear, shame, humiliation, confusion, followed by symptom clusters. And again, these symptoms may be exacerbated by cumulative small assault. Um, Re-experiencing, so the person may have distressing memories, nightmares, intrusive thoughts, flashbacks, distress over reminders of the event. They may experience avoidance. They may try not to think about it. They may avoid white people. They may isolate themselves for their own safety and well-being. Um, they may have negative mood and cognition, so depression, anxiety. They may believe that the world is unsafe. They may blame themselves. They may be filled with self-doubt, guilt, and anger. And then finally, a physiological arousal, which results in hypervigilance, um, because you're always on alert for whatever danger might pop up. You may have an increased startle response because of that. You may sleep poorly. Uh, because, you know, if danger's around the corner, how can you rest and have concentration problems? And these are all PTSD symptoms. And this is what um, my client was experiencing. Okay. Yeah. All right. So she sought out consultation. She wanted to get... She knew she needed treatment, and she wanted to get the best treatment she, she could get. So she went to a top university center. And this was where I was at the moment, where um, she was diagnosed with severe PTSD. Um, and again, she was um, also had uh, panic and agoraphobia secondary to the PTSD. Um, she was advised to seek workers' compensation for the cost of treatment. She was taking vacation days at that point in order to not have to go back to work. And um, it had to be explained to her, look, you have a medical condition. You can't work right now. And you need treatment. Well, she was only willing to work with a female, a female black therapist. And you can imagine how many female black therapists there were at that expert PTSD center. There was only one, and that was me. And I was actually already full of clients. But I knew that if I didn't see her, she wasn't going to find the help she needed. Um, and this is. And this could be a potential barrier to treatment when um, people are looking for people like them to help them with their with their problems and they can't find one. Um, so she was assessed. I, I assessed her with um, several clinically validated measures. And she was very cheerful at points during the interview. 
had many fears about her work environment and a lot of personal distress. She felt like a failure. She had always done so well in the past and couldn't figure out why she had suddenly, uh, suddenly collapsed. Um, so again, her treatment, her symptoms were severe, and um, she was given an empirically supported treatment for PTSD, which is called prolonged exposure, which is a great evidence base behind it. And um, and I, as her therapist, went to weekly group supervision with international experts on PTSD to make sure that I was getting the best advice in terms of how to best treat her. And after completing the therapy, she was no longer fearful of the trauma memory, but she was still terrified to return to work. And so our job was not done as clinicians um, because she still wasn't functional. And, and we had to figure out what, what we had missed in terms of helping her. And I can tell you that the, the other Therapists really didn't understand the racial piece of this, and some of the therapists didn't understand how she had become so traumatized by a racist event because it just wasn't part of their experience. Um, and so I realized that we would need an ideographic case formulation. Um, we would need to address her specific concerns to think about how we could best help her. Um, there were really several relevant cultural issues that hadn't been adequately addressed. Um, the um, white psychologist at the Expert Treatment Center, they couldn't understand it, so they really couldn't advise on how to address the anxiety connected to racism. And so I consulted with a board-certified African-centered psychologist for additional treatment strategies. Um, okay. And so you might be wondering, yeah. Sorry, uh, so we are having some, we're getting some really good feedback, but sometimes the participants are having a hard time hearing you. I'm not sure if it's an issue with the mic on that end or if it's on this end. Okay, I'm sorry, I am squeezed up as, as um, close as, my, as I can to my computer, and I'm going to turn up my input volume if I can. If it'll let me. Okay, great. Thank you. I mean, you sound fine right now. It's just uh, it's just an issue that's come up a few times, but I think it's okay. Okay. I'm sorry. I'm going to try to be very um, mindful about keeping uh, my face really close to the the sound system here. <laughs> okay. I'm sorry. I apologize if you can't hear everything I'm saying. Um, okay. So. So the issue is that you might think that, well, she had a black therapist, so shouldn't that have been good enough to address the, the racial issues? And it can really be helpful to do ethnic matching when possible. And again, this assumes that the therapist is at, at an advanced stage of their own racial identity development, right? Because some people of color aren't comfortable being people of color, and, and that's going to be an obstacle, too, if you're not comfortable in your own skin. But the point that I wanted to make is having a black therapist does not automatically guarantee a culturally competent approach. And you might say, why? And it's because we as clinicians, even, even us black clinicians, are typically trained by white people from a Eurocentric perspective using Eurocentric methods that were tested and validated on white people. And so we can't just assume that a treatment even though it's empirically validated, is going to necessarily be a complete solution to address our clients' needs when, when they're ethnically different. So, so that was one, one problem. So we had to kind of back up a little bit and think about how we were going to best address this. And so um, there's a whole school of thought surrounding African-centered or black psychology. There's even an association of black psychologists, and they have this great journal called the Journal of Black Psychology. I have a paper under review with them now. I'm really, really hoping I can get it in. Um, and African-centered psychology focuses, it has a focus that's a little different from um, typical um, Western psychology. The emphasis is on things like balance and centering in life, um, harmony and interconnectedness, the capacity for self-healing, unique personal experiences, spirituality, um, typically a belief in God or a creator who made the universe, and 
um, relationships and kinships and the importance of the, of the importance of the collective. So, so there are a lot of facets of um, of this that we thought would be important to include in in our treatment of this client. Additionally, the literature showed that P the experience of PTSD can be different for African Americans. So typically, PTSD cognitions include self-blame, negative thoughts about the world, and negative thoughts about the self. But African Americans tend to already have more negative thoughts about the world and actually less self-blame than European Americans. And so um, this also showed us an area where we might need, where we might best think a little differently about how to approach treatment. So interventions for African Americans may be most effective if they're focused on improving self-concept and self-esteem rather than self-blame surrounding the trauma. Um, and then also, um, also was important to consider the role of vicarious traumatization and ethno-violence. Sometimes it can be traumatic just knowing that other people have gone through the same thing and hearing about, so for example, these things we've heard on the news recently about unarmed black men being killed by police. These can be things that vicariously traumatize all of us because we have a cultural memory um, and history of things like this. So these are all important things we had to consider. We refocused the treatment on the patient's expectations about the workplace, uh, her experiences of racism, and um, the fear that there was no safe place for her. And so one of the big issues was she was feeling like, I've worked so hard um, to be taken seriously and recognized by white people, but no matter where I go, I'm going to have to deal with this because people aren't going to give me the respect and appreciation that I've earned. And so, um, so this was a really important, um, this was a really important cognition for her that we needed to address. Um, okay. So, I'm just reading a couple of your comments. Um, some of you asked if we have found this to be helpful with other ethnicities and cultures, such as Hispanic cultures when referring to black psychology. And I think there are a lot of important and valuable things in black psychology that are helpful for, um, for other ethnic groups as well, particularly with the emphasis on um, family and collectivism. Um, however, there is a whole school of thought surrounding Hispanic psychology as well, which is better, uh, better focused um, in that way. And so, and so I hope that answers your question there. Um, and I think that we all grow just from learning about other cultures in general and how to, and how to navigate and, and help people who are different. Um, okay, so one of the things we did was we helped to instill more realistic expectations in the client about her coworkers. And also we determined that maybe this wasn't a healthy place for her and we made an escape plan. So that if if it turned out that this wasn't the right work environment for her, she would have other options. And she actually was approached by headhunters quite a lot um, who were looking to bring her to other companies. And she didn't want to leave because she didn't want to feel like she had been beaten. And she didn't want the other black women who looked up to her to feel that she had given up. And and those were um, so it was very important for her to be able to go back to work. But we also tempered that with maybe this isn't the right job for you, and if it gets to the point where it's not serving you, let's think about what you need to do for yourself. And she was very sweet like that, always thinking of other people. Okay. Now, I wish I could say that was the end of the story. <laughs> but unfortunately, after I left Penn, I transferred her care actually to the board-certified African-centered therapist that I had consulted to help her in the first place. Um, she was a lot better at that point, but she still needed some ongoing support. And workers' comp was paying for her treatment, and they didn't want to pay anymore. And what we ended up seeing was some ongoing ethno-violence against my client um, as a result. So workers' comp insisted on having her reevaluated, and even though we made it very clear to them that she needed to be evaluated by a female, ideally an African-American female, she would get scheduled with white males. And we would have to go back and say, no, this is not acceptable. Uh, she was assessed with measures that were not culturally um, 
appropriate and that they weren't interpreted in a culturally appropriate way. For example, the MMPI. Um, there are certain ways you need to think about interpreting it differently with African Americans, and it's well documented in the literature as well, and I won't go into detail about how it needs to be um, used differently, but um, the clinician who evaluated her with it did not take her culture into consideration when looking at those results and came up with the worst possible conclusions. They wanted to stop paying for treatment and have her return to work prematurely, which would have traumatized her. Um, the, the clinician who was hired to reevaluate her came up with some really ridiculous findings, which I have excerpted here on the right. The patient has described anxiety symptoms that she attributes to the comments made by a coworker at a dinner in Sydney. Note comments, not threats. Um, it's my opinion that the behavior of the coworker did not cause an experience necessary for the development of the condition of post-traumatic stress disorder, and patient was not subject to an experience from the company that would cause post-traumatic stress disorder. And I, I have to point out how utterly ridiculous this is because my patient was assessed by three experts in PTSD who all agreed that she had it, and but for some reason this random um, psychiatrist who gave her an M M MMPI is qualified now to make um, this decision in the face of, of, um, of a, a thick stack of evidence that she was, in fact, traumatized by this event. So we have, so what we see is the patient suffering being met with doubt and ridicule by people who should know better. Um, the Afrocentric psychologist was considered unsuitable, even though she had a PhD and um, was a president of several mental health organizations in the area, and even though we had referred her. And they wanted to get another clinician to say that the patient was recovered. So they actually contacted other clinicians at the clinic where I was and told them they wanted to hire them to reevaluate her and also said on the front end, oh, and this is the, these are the findings you need to come up with. So we knew that this wasn't even on the up and up. And so all of this was re-traumatized her and slowed her recovery. And, um, and this was very unfortunate. And, this is, and I think that this is an important example of how um, even though when we, even despite our best efforts, um, these things can continue to, to traumatize our clients. Okay. And so I'm seeing a few people noting that they're having trouble with the link for um, mentalhealthdisparities.org, which is the website for the Center for Mental Health Disparities at the University of Louisville. Don't worry, don't panic. If you can't find it, it is there. And I will double check this after our presentation, okay? Because I want you guys to be able to get all the good info that I have there for you. So don't worry. I will make sure. I'm the webmaster for the site, so I will make sure it's there for you. I just can't check it right now because I'm doing this presentation. All right. Okay, so now we're going to talk briefly about integrating multicultural issues into therapy. Um, and a lot of us have grown up with the golden rule, you know, treat other people the way you want to be treated. But we have to think a little differently about that when working with people from different cultures. Don't treat clients the way you want to be treated. Treat them the way they want to be treated. And that means that you understand and respect their culture. All right. So here's a... So in terms of expectations about race and racism and helping relationships, most minorities have already encountered discrimination in other contexts, um, including medical contexts. And so you, if you notice your clients seem distant or mistrustful of you, you want to validate that and acknowledge that mistrust um, because actually they're right to be mistrustful. You, we need to earn their trust. Ask clients about their previous experiences with mental health and medical professionals and raise these things early in the relationship because that conveys cultural sensitivity and may address some of their concerns about having a racially different clinician. Now, um, this is our next poll question. Does discussing race with clients make you feel uncomfortable? Yes, no, or somewhat? And so you... Um, you should see those poll questions, and I want you all to very quickly click on one of those, yes, no, or somewhat. There's no wrong answer. Uh, but I do want to know how, how you feel.
All right. So somebody asked in terms of my client, um, isn't it the nature of workers' comp in general to limit treatment and the amount of time the employee is out? I've come across that in many situations. Yes, I have come across that too. But I think what was particularly unique about this situation is that her experience was um, discounted. I mean, she was basically told, well, despite the expert opinion of three uh, three psychologists, this this incident couldn't and didn't cause cause you harm, um, which on top of everything else she experienced, very, very hard to hear. Um, okay, so we have our poll results in, and does discussing race with clients make you feel uncomfortable? So only 5% of you said yes, wow, and 34% said no, that's awesome. And then 26 said somewhat, thank you for your honesty. So uh, so those are great results. And then 84 of you didn't answer. I wish I knew what all of you thought. Okay, but we're gonna talk a little bit about some ways to make sure that you can be culturally sensitive when working with um, your traumatized clients. Uh, first of all, respect is super important um, among ethnic minorities, and that may be more important than rapport. So a lot of us are trained to develop rapport, but showing respect may be the best way to do that. And this isn't to say that, I mean, obviously everybody wants to be respected, and this isn't necessarily true for every single member of every ethnic minority group. These are kind of just general tips to help you out, and so I don't want you to get hung up on that, but these are, um, things that you know research has shown can be really helpful. All right, so um, other things is keep in mind the variability in respectful behavior cross-culturally, so you'll have to be sensitive as to what actually, what act, sorts of behaviors are actually respectful to people in the group that you're working with. Um, for example, um, during an assessment, we do a lot of repeated questioning, and for some, some people, the um, direct uh, repeated questioning can feel very respectful. And so you might think about um, if you need to maybe change the style a little bit and make it more conversational, um, if that's going to resonate better with your client. Um, identify cultural strengths and supports. And so um, this is really important, I think, for ethnic minorities who may get the message a lot of time that there's something wrong with them. And so if you just sort of come out of the gate with, okay, here are all your diagnoses, they may only hear these are all the things that are wrong with you. And you will get a lot more traction out of talking about strengths and support and resilience and the things that have allowed them to persevere and keep moving in the face of obstacles and oppression. And so, um, so you really want to balance your conversation about psychopathology with strengths. And these can include personal strengths, such as pride in their culture, their faith, their uh, linguistic abilities, interpersonal support, such as extended family, traditions, and environmental supports, maybe um, ethnic foods and access to cultural activities. So these are all, these are all important. Um, you want to make sure that you're keyed into internal versus external influences, where we, when we say internal, we mean cognitive factors versus external or environmental or situational factors. Um, so, uh, so one example, okay, hold on, let me turn the page here. Um, so naturally we are gathering information about both things. However, um, there, there can be some drawbacks if we are really kind of too quick to just look at those internal factors without getting a big picture of the environment that that person is in and without appropriately considering the impact of their, of their environment and the cultural context. And here's an example of something you, you know, of a question you might ask somebody when recounting details of being rescued from a motor vehicle accident. The therapist might ask, how did it feel to be carried by the white EMT who was speaking sharply to you? So this experience could be very upsetting to um, a minority client who might say something like, it felt humiliating, like he was blaming me for what happened. Um, and if someone says something like that, well, that can show you, you need to explore that further. Or the client might say, you know, I really didn't notice I was still reeling from the accident, just glad to be alive. 
and, and then it may be safe to move on. So you should really approach this line of inquiry from a probing and exploratory position um, to uncover things that are relevant for your client. But don't be afraid to ask the question. Um, and then in terms of addressing environmentally based problems, the treatment should include making changes that minimize stressors, increase personal strength and support, and build skills for more effectively interacting with the environment. Um, so therapists can approach environmental issues by asking questions like, did you think the police would believe that a white man did this to you? Or the other people at your workplace were expecting you to fail because you were Hispanic, but is this really a failure? So, so those are ways that the environment can be addressed. And, and if you only take away one thing from this presentation today, it's this slide, validate self-reported experiences of oppression. So when a client discloses that they've been discriminated against, don't automatically look for an alternative explanation um, because they've already been invalidated enough times and they need you to believe and support them. Um, so, um, and so that's what you want to lead with. Okay, and it's important also to understand in terms of helping your clients move forward that although racism, racism is not ever going to go away completely from their environment, but in terms of their trauma, the trauma is, you know, is a one-time event in history that they can move beyond. Emphasize collaboration over confrontation. Um, so confrontational means using vigor and force and counteracting irrational philosophies and behaviors of the client. But you want to align yourself to be collaborative in working with them. Um, this means, this may mean even things like communicating your understanding of the system of privilege and oppression in which the client lives. Um, you want the client to feel that you're there with them and that you're, that you are a part of helping them get better and, and that you're in it together. Um, in terms of cognitive restructuring, um, you want to make sure to um, be helpful in terms of in terms of questioning the rationality of a belief. So you don't want to appear naive or uncaring. So rather than asking them if something that they're believing is valid, um, think about whether or not it's helping them. So I might tell my client, you know, you have every right to be angry, and you've been angry for ten years. Is this helping you? Um, so that's one thing to think about. Don't try to change their core cultural beliefs. And this is really important because, for example, if you come from an individualistic worldview, telling a client who's got a collectivistic worldview that they need to separate themselves from their family that is stressing them out, well, that's not going to resonate for them. They're going to they're gonna think that you um, don't understand or appreciate uh, their cultural beliefs, and so it's important to keep that in mind. Um, help them come up with a list of helpful things they can tell themselves when things are tough, um, and, and that could include internal coping resources, past successes that they're valued by others, community and family, and support from a higher power. And then finally, make sure that homework that you assign makes sense for them culturally. Um, and, and if homework is tough, just ask them, what's the smallest step you could take to feel like you're making progress? So I'm going to end there and ask if you have any questions that you'd like me to address. I know we only have like a minute left, and you guys have been great. I've loved your questions and comments so far. And I'll be around. You can also contact me directly by... Um, email if you have further questions or if you want um, me to um, respond to a question that you may have about a client or a clinical situation, I'm always glad to, glad to help. Here's my contact information. And, um, and I know that some of, some of you sent comments. So we've got 288 people online, and many of you have sent in, uh, questions and comments. And I could not address them all. I'm so sorry. I wish I could because you, have, you all have some really awesome questions and comments, but, um, but I do uh, thank you for, for putting those through, and, um, and I can try to follow up with you by email for those of you who would like as well. Um, and 
Yes, so someone has asked me, given the current climate of African Americans being targeted by police, have you seen an increase in PTSD in people of color? And I have definitely seen um, a lot of vicarious traumatization, even among my, my students. So thank you for that question. Okay, I think I have to stop. Are they going to pull a cane out? Thank you, Dr. Williams, for such a great presentation. Um, Everyone, I do apologize that we can't get to all of your questions and comments, but please know that I have noted them down. Um, and if Dr. Williams, if you're willing to answer them at a later time, that would be great. We could create a PDF and put it on our website um, to share with everyone. Um, but I do want to make sure that we do get to the um, CEU process. So a number of you had some questions and concerns. Uh, once you do create your profile on the School of Social Work site that we shared earlier, I'll share it again. Um, you, will you will be able to get an email after this webinar about a knowledge test. After completing the knowledge test, you will receive your credit. Um, so please do make sure that you do that. Um, if you have any questions or concerns, we will send you an email address where you can direct those to. And thank you so much for participating. Dr. Williams, thank you so much for the presentation. Clearly a lot of people have questions and comments and they're very intrigued by this topic. So we hope that we could continue the conversation. Yeah, thank you for having me. I really enjoyed this. You guys were a great bunch. All right, take care, everyone. All righty.